for people to use. And so this video, which is on the NIH public access um, policy site, is a conversation between him and the director of NIH. And he basically talks about, you know, where he got information and how open access helped him and what he did when he ran into paywalls. Um, his parents aren't academics, he's not affiliated, you know, neither of them are affiliated with any universities. So that's why we're doing this, so that those stories of unexpected readers can rise to the top. So with that, we'll come to copyright. <laughs> um, before we do, any other questions about the Illinois policy or the policies in front of you? Because I know a lot of us are looking at the Illinois policy and trying to figure out how this might play out. Any other questions? Has anybody been involved in their campuses and actually talking about the policy with faculty or anybody? No? Okay. Do you know whether people are actually, are administrators actually like, think, or faculty thinking about this? Are they aware of it? Um, and they wrote a 
a chapter on implementing open access policies. Um, I'll try to get, I'll get Fatima the, um, the link to that and the citation. But it actually describes in detail sort of all of the issues that play in implementing an open access policy. It includes things like the MIT workflow. Because um, I think it's important that we, you know, have a good awareness of what it takes to set up an OA policy. And the last thing I'll say about that is that the library, and, you know, one of the things that we're doing at UAUC at the library is we've set up an internal task force just to look at, you know, so what are the different scenarios that could come out of this, and what would be the sort of resource and implementation costs of doing that. Um, and that might be something um, that, you know, all of us should begin to sort of think about so that when our task force are set up, we can provide information. So. Okay. I'm going to now start on copyright. Um, you know, actually, perhaps we should take a 10-minute break now um, and come back. Is that you can that's okay? Is that yes, please? <laughs> but yes, okay, let's do a 10 minute break right now and then we'll come back. So if you could come back at 5 2 and then we'll come back and talk about the race. Uh, 
Um, was here. Yeah, she was watching my Jim, she came in on Friday. She's supposed to came back today, but I didn't see her. Oh, okay.
Yeah. But in, like if you're Disney and you buy the rights to something, if you're a corporation and which you have the rights of a human, but you never die, right? Can it be kind of going on and on and on? Uh, no, not really. They can keep extending it um, by legal means. So it was extended the last, in the last time it was extended. It was extended to the life of the author plus um, 70 years. Um, when, right when Mickey Mouse was about to come out of, of copyright, and Disney and many entertainment corporations actually then sort of, you know, basically lobby Congress to extend that um, much, much longer than it, than it was. So at some point it will, they, the works will enter the public domain, um, but um, it, it'll just take a really long time. So. Um, Okay, so that's where it comes from. The most important thing to think about when you're thinking about copyright issues, um, particularly when you're going to be thinking about um, sort of use of work, if you're in academia and you're thinking about, um, you know, what, you need to think about what you want to be able to do with your work post, you know, you want to publish it. But are there things you might want to do with it post publication or things that you might want to allow other people to do with your work? post-publication. So what what are the types of things that you might want to be able to do with your work? <coughs> Sorry? To use it. To use it, right? Sure. <coughs> Any examples of that? In the classroom. Right, so um, a really like nice a copy. Yeah, so a nice example of that is um, use of figures and charts, perhaps, that you create in one article that you might want to republish in another article. If you've actually signed your copyright away to a publisher, technically, um, if you're republishing that, you have to ask permission from your publisher, even if you are the original creator of that work, right? So, um, you know, there's, a, there's lots of things like that. So if you want to allow translation of your work, you know, if you've signed away your copyright, you no longer have the rights to say yay or nay to somebody to do a translation, your publisher does, right? And who knows whether that will be in your best interest, so, yeah. If somebody wants to make a major motion picture out of my fascinating computer science research, that, I want a piece of that action. That's right, <laughs> that, that's right, but that's, I mean, that's a really, you know, that's an example of, uh, that's a great example of a derivative work. And it's also a great example of the um, leverage that some people have in negotiations. So, Harry Potter, right? So, J.K. Rowling had to give permission to the studios to be able, for them to be able to make that movie. Because she retained copyright of, of um, the Harry Potter books, not the publisher. Uh, but she was also able to leverage that, so she had a lot of control and a lot of say over the process. So she was integrally involved in the production of those films. And she was able to do that because she had the leverage as the copyright holder to be able to do that, right? And also, um, if you keep track of Harry Potter, the electronic versions of the book took a long time to come out. And that was also because she had so much leverage and she wanted to make sure that it came out the right way, so she had control over that. Um, with, with academic book contracts, there are pieces of the contract that say, um, and in journal articles as well, that um, you know, the publisher owns, owns the content um, in this form and any other forms to come. So they cover that. Yeah. So if, if something happens and you know, PDF goes away and there's another format, that replaces the end, yeah. the publisher will still own it even the format of the thing has changed. So to give a real example of that, I have a, I was contacted by a history faculty member who is an emeritus actually, and she had authored a book on the, um, let's say the Tudors in England, the royal family um, in the 1980s. And it was sort of her seminal, her seminal book and she discovered that it was for sale on a site called Questia, which, you know, where they sell a lot of sort of studies and other things. And she was furious because she regarded
regarded that site as very um, not a very high quality site. She was really mad that this book, her book, was for sale there. And I had to say to her, "Do you have the book contract? <laughs> what did your book contracts, you know, stipulate? Because the contract governs what happens with your book." And she had, in fact, signed away all rights to her book, you know, in terms of what you know, derivative works they could create, different platforms they could put it on, they could make decisions selling it on third party sites. I mean, so they were able to do all of that. So all of this, again, it all comes down to copyright ownership um, and understanding that. And so I spent a lot of time, one of the, I teach a lot of workshops on author rights, what I call author rights, copyright, um, for both our faculty and our graduate students. Um, and also increasingly for undergraduates, because I think really understanding, controlling your own work is, is really critical. So, um, I sort of talked about this already, but you know, so the Constitution permits copyright in order to benefit creators, but in balance with the community, right? So you're, it's to promote science and the useful arts. Um, but for academic works, generally because the bulk of us are signing away our copyright to publishers, the, the publishers usually get the benefit. And it actually is really about control. And you know, in economic um, terms, you know, it essentially creates um, you know, the, sort of a complete control over the, the academic works. If you're signing over the copyright completely to the publishers, the publishers can control the price they can control the availability, they control the access. You know, and that within the sort of academic sphere where the point of academia is to share knowledge and to encourage research and to make sure our students have access to the best research possible, to make sure our faculty can build on research to further things. Um, you know, there is something really wrong with So this is, I think, you know, what we're really aiming, you know, as a sort of a base level service, I think, libraries are really in a good position to talk to our students and faculty about this issue, to at least encourage folks to read the copyright transfer agreements and the book contracts, if nothing else, right? So if you're giving away your copyright to do it knowingly, to understand what those copyright transfer agreements say, um, and to you know to do it intentionally, to say you know what, you know I'm a untenured faculty member. I have to publish in this journal. It's the most prestigious journal in my discipline. In order for me to get tenure, I hate this these terms, but at least I know what I'm signing. Right? Too often, you know, we don't know what we're signing. How many of you have actually published and? So a handful. How many of you read the, after I just frank you about reading it, but how many of you actually do read the copyright transfer? Okay, so some of you do, right? Um, has anybody ever tried to negotiate? So, yeah. I mean, it, it, I think it's very difficult sometimes to actually do that negotiation. But. So, um, and we'll talk about that in just a, a little bit. So, um, what is copyright? So, copyright is actually a bundle of rights, which is why when you read a copyright transfer agreement, and we're going to be handing out some so you can take a look at what these look like, you'll often find um, all this language sort of parsing out all of these different rights um, that the publisher is claiming. So, there's the right to make copies, so, um, you know, just Xeroxing. Uh, you know, copying uh, is, is a copyright. Um, there's the right to distribute the work. These two things combined are really what you need in order to publish something, right? You have to be able to make copies of something and you have to be able to distribute it. Um, it also includes the right to prepare derivative works. So we've talked about derivative works, but derivative works are essentially things that are based on the original work that are reliant on the original work. So something like, um, that aren't fair use, um, 
talk about variants in a second. But a translation is a derivative work. A movie is a derivative work. You could, in some cases, have um, perhaps a journal article coming from a conference paper that could be considered a derivative work, potentially. So you had a question? <clears throat> Do successive editions qualify as derivative work? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And you often actually find in book contracts it's specified whether or not the author has a, a right of first refusal to do a second edition. In fact, if you are producing, uh, if you are writing uh, something that could have subsequent editions or editing something, you may very well want to make sure that's in your book contract, that you have the right to, to you have the right of first refusal for subsequent editions so that a publisher can sort of pull that rug out from under you and give a future edition to somebody else, which happens in things like textbooks. So, yeah, I mentioned Cory Doctorow. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> uh, one of the, I think one of the interesting things <coughs> with derivative works, and actually with, with much of this, is that um, you can, there are ways in which to um, permit use of some of these that go beyond fair use. So in particular with derivative works, using something like a Creative Commons license can allow um, others to actually do things with their work. So um, Cory Doctorow, do people know who he is? He's actually, he's a sort of science, science fiction slash, I don't know, tech, tech futurist yes. writer, right? He's actually written um, a couple of very popular um, young adult novels, one called Little Brother. Um, he always issues them under a Creative Commons license, which allows, in particular, translation of his work, plays made of his work. So plays are another great example of a potential derivative work play created out of a novel. So his, so, you know, he sees Lots. He sees uh, different um, uh, covers for his books. Lots of very interesting uses of his work that have really expanded his reach. You know, he's reaching many more people. And he talks about how he actually is making more money because he's actually done this. So more people are actually buying his book, even if it is available and people can make it available in other forms. And what's um, especially significant is that the license he used is a is a share and like license. So for uh, people can go ahead and create these different derivative works, and then he asks that people send him a link to what they've done, so he can post it on his blog, and other people can um, can enjoy it and access it as well. And on his blog, he has a really interesting um, write up about why he's done this and the generosity of his publisher and how they have worked through a lot of the concerns that the publisher had. And so his website um, is, is really interesting in terms of a popular writer and how they have control over their work. And his, uh, his website is, I think it's crackhouse.org. Is that right? Yeah. Crackhouse. I don't know. <laughs> 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 it's So if two or more people offer a work, so if you have co-authors, 
you are joint copyright holders. Um, there's no sort of division of copyright, so it's not like I have 20% of the copyright and you have 80% of the copyright. Um, it's all equal. Um, and then with some exceptions, um, and universities are a big part of that exception, um, if you are creating work as a condition of your employment, generally your employer holds the copyright, so that's a work for hire. Now, this is where universities um, often have policies that specify that their faculty and students retain copyright in their academic works, and that uh, that is not, uh, the university does not claim copyright in that. Now, um, there are exceptions to that, so I, I've seen cases where there were, if there were substantive university resources used in the creation of a work, say a textbook, for example, um, the university may claim joint copyright in that work. There's also been some interesting cases around curriculum development and syllabi, where um, often the university might claim joint ownership of syllabi, but it sort of, it depends on the university. Um, there was a case that went to court, and this is actually where I'll also say that copyright is, <laughs> sort of copyright resolution, um, whenever you ask a lawyer a copyright question, they'll say, it depends. Um, because the resolution of copyright disputes usually only happens in the courts, right? So there's not often a definitive cut and dry answer. So that's why sometimes talking to intellectual property lawyers can be infuriating uh, because they'll always say it depends. Um, and so uh, there was a case where a university, and I'm forgetting the details, I can try to take them out, but the university uh, claimed joint ownership of a faculty member syllabi. The faculty, so the faculty member had left the university, taken his course with them, and was putting on another university, but had taken all the materials, and the university was a core course, and the university, the department basically said, wait a second, that's our core course. We want that syllabi, that's our syllabi. And so, um, in the court system, the university decided on the side of the department, on, on the side of the university, uh, that that syllabi was created uh, in the course of his employment. Uh, so, you know, it, again, it can get complicated. Um, so why couldn't they right? both use it, though? Right, I mean, they, they certainly could. I mean, I think a more am amicable choice would have been to share, you know, to share that syllabus. But you do find faculty who are, you know, are very possessive. They spend a lot of time and energy in creating a course and, you know, have really put a lot of intellectual effort into creation of that course. And they, you know, so I, I can understand that as, as well. Um, you know, I think that in a lot of cases, that probably is what happens in practice. When a faculty member leaves, particularly if it's core courses, they may actually share it. But you know, it's a lot of intellectual effort. And there was an interesting, I have seen faculty, I saw an interesting post by a faculty member at one point who was really angry because he found somebody had cribbed his course at another university, so he had published his syllabi online and made it openly available, and somebody had taken it without attribution without saying anything about where they got this, this course and where they're passing it off was there. So you do find a lot of ownership of those. The other thing to know about copyright is it just happens. So it happens from the point of creation, the, the moment that something is in a fixed form. So, I, me just talk, so ignoring the camera in the back of the room, pretending that's not there. If I'm just up here talking to you, it's just words coming out of my mouth, there's no fixed form here, right? So you can't copyright the ideas that I'm coming up with. So I came up with this brilliant theory. You could write that down and publish it and claim ownership over that, right? Um, and I couldn't do anything to stop you except, you know, make, you know, claims that you violated um, ethics, but, um, but there's no legal standing there, right? 
Um, so it has to be fixed in tangible form, and then it lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. You do not have to say anywhere on a paper, copyright 2013, Sarah Shreves. Um, it used to be that you had to state that, but that was done away with quite some time ago now. So you actually don't have to say anything to invoke copyright. It just happens. So this is, you know, one of the things you see a lot of confusion about on the web is people use photographs, people just sort of copy, you know, students, faculty, think they, you know, you can just copy things willy-nilly because it's on the web and there's no copyright statement. But there doesn't have to be a copyright statement. You know, so um, you can assume most things um, on the web are actually under copyright or a lot of it. Any questions so far? Yeah. So, Yes. 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 So, so if it's an electronic form and you've saved it, you know, the minute that file gets saved to your hard drive, it's a tangible form. Yeah. That's a that's a good question. So I suppose the first time you start writing something in Microsoft Word and it hasn't actually really saved, maybe. Copyright from ownership. 
because um, data can certainly be owned, um, and so you can do things like restrict access, restrict use, all of those sorts of things. And that's so that's a whole separate conversation from the, the copyright conversation. And also, data by itself has no meaning. That's why it doesn't go to the copyright. Well, data by itself might have. I mean, but there should be something in front of that that, that uh, bring meaning to that. Yeah, so, so I, maybe what you're getting at. So data, so what's needed for copyright protection is some level of creativity. Yes. So you have a data set so a straight data set, say temperatures, um, or in, you know, sort of maybe combined with some other factual data sets, and you just have the raw data there, not protected by copyright. However, if you do a visualization of that, and you do figures based on that, that can be copyrighted yes. because there's creativity there, right? But the raw data behind that cannot be copyrighted. It can be restricted, it can be owned, all of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the once hard back, digitized. So as then um, someone comes along and takes the data from the digitized. Oh. So if it's just data, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I actually, we, I have a colleague in the library at Illinois who's actually been going through old business directories um, that she's found, and most of that data actually hasn't been extracted. So lots of information, factual information about location of businesses historically, number of employees, et cetera, et cetera. And so she's been sort of painstakingly extracting this data and then pulling it into spreadsheets. And um, you know, she's using, in some cases, in copyright works, but because she's pulling out the, the, just the data, she's not doing something with that directory in its tangible, fixed form. She's a, I, I would say, and I should say I am not a lawyer, <laughs> But, but I, I would guess that, that, she's, that she's okay, right? So because she's, she's just, she's pulling out that factual information. Now if there was sort of additional information in that, so a good case of this is our bibliographic databases. Our bibliographic databases has have lots of factual information, right? Titles, authors, year of publication, publisher. It also has non-factual information, subject headings, maybe the abstracts, other sorts of pieces that are not, you know, those creative energy went into those. If you talk to publishers and others, often they'll claim, they'll say, okay, yeah, sort of the facts are fine for you to extract and do things with, but you can't have our subject headings, you know, so because those, <coughs> there's some creative effort that, that went into those. Does that make sense?
copy of this sort of cut and paste like images. I used to get their paper dolls all the time when I was a little girl. But um, uh, they can do what they do because they're using works that are in the public domain, right? So they can resell that. They can do whatever they, they want with that material. That includes works published before 1923, works published without notice prior to 1989. So this is prior to 1989. You did have to have that copyright um, 1988 Sarah on a on a work for it to be copyright. If it didn't have that, um, it wasn't in copyright. Works not renewed prior to 1963. So there used to be a time where you actually had to reactively renew your copyright. Um, in order to retain copyright, and if you failed to renew it, then it went into the public domain. Um, works of the federal government, um, and then the things that are actually not covered by copyright at all, titles, um, short phrases, facts, and ideas. Um, this gets really super complicated very fast. There's a great um, work um, that Peter Hurdle, who is at Cornell, has done to cover what's in the public domain, and it covers, there's lots of complications with um, recorded music, lots of other types of things like that. So it gets really complicated. He has a great, very long guide <laughs> that covers all of these different pieces. I'm sorry, the second one works published without doing this. Without notice. The second so works published without notice prior to 1989. What does it mean? So without notice, if it didn't say copyright 20 or 1988. You don't need that. You say that as soon as the. You don't need that anymore. Before 1989, you did. Oh yeah, because the exchange. Because now we say that as soon as you create something. Yes. Now as soon as you create something, it's under copyright. But prior to 1989, you did not need that. And this is also, I should say, 1989 is the year that they changed the length. So this also was part of that law that changed the length of the copyright regime, thanks to this thing. There was a question for that. Yeah? Um, I think it has to do with the law. So, but why, um, after nine, why is the 1933 rolling up so that it becomes 24 or 25 or whatever? I mean, is there any movement to get it, you know, because we're older and things are... <laughs> yeah, older. right. I, I had a colleague who did a study that basically said she did it, she had a nephew who was like six and, you know, she's in her early 40s and she was calculating that it wouldn't be until his grandchildren were in their 40s that her works that she created would be in the public domain. Um, there have been efforts to... To sort of, um, so that was an arbitrary date? I would say it's fairly arbitrary. I would, I'll notice that 19, 1923 is post-Disney. <laughs> I mean, you, it's oh. post-Disney. It's oh. post oh. the sort of creation of Mickey Mouse, et cetera. So a lot of, um, you know, so you can't underestimate the entertainment industry in particular is really governing what's happening with copyright law. There have been efforts to rationalize copyright law to sort of make it easier. We've had some amazing legal minds trying to push this forward. We've also had um, cases taken to court trying to, to push this forward. But um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been an uphill battle. I think um, the creation of the Creative Commons licensing is probably the best thing we've seen. A way at least to um, get around some of the limitations of copyright copyright law, as well as some of the there's a lot of efforts in different communities to create best practices um, for uh, copyright. So if you haven't seen this within the library community, um, the ARL ACRL put together um, best practices um, for fair use in libraries that talks about things like creation of exhibits, digitization, e-reserves, and other things. So it tries to set out basically like a code of best practices. 
that if the community can align behind a code of best practices, the, the thinking behind this is, is that will actually hold sway in, in court cases, that there is this common agreement that this is how we interpret this. And um, so if you're not familiar with that, I would definitely encourage taking a look at it. There's, there's also another document um, specifically about, I think it's specifically about documentary film. Yes. There's one for choreography. There's one for dance. There's one for documentary films. Um, I want to say there's others. So there is movement in some areas to create these codes of best practices around fair use specifically. Any other questions? I'm going to talk about managing rights. Is this new or is this, is this making sense to people? Okay. Okay. So copyright can only be transferred uh, or assigned in writing. So you actually have to um, sign something um, in order to transfer your copyright. Um, and you can also have, so the other way that you can do um, a sort of copyright or rights assignment is to actually license rights. So you can do a wholesale transfer of copyright. So I have all my copyrights and I'm going to give them all to you. So now you have them all and you can do what you want with them. Or I can also license my rights. So I can say, well, I'm going to hold on to my copyrights, but I'm going to give you a license to make it through derivative works out of my work. Um, you can um, do a license transfer that is exclusive. So if I give you exclusive rights to make derivative works, I can't give you any rights to make derivative works because I've given them all to her. If it's non-exclusive, that means I can give everybody <laughs> rights to, to make a derivative work of my works. Now, licenses are slightly different than copyright transfer also in that you don't have to necessarily have a sign. You have to have an agreement, um, but it doesn't always have to be a signed agreement. This is where you sometimes see publishers using click-through licenses you can actually click through a license, um, which makes it much more difficult if you want to negotiate that process. Because the licenses that you see from publishers um, are invariably exclusive licenses. And they're usually exclusive full licenses in that you're giving, you might retain copyright, but in effect you've given it all away to the publisher. And you know, often they're you know, not irrevocable, so, um, or they're irrevocable, so you can't revoke them. Um, they're perpetual, so they're forever, and, you know, until, copyright, until the copyright ends. So you sometimes see um, the, the licensing sort of in effect, you're transferring copyright. Now, the other thing,